All right, today you are within the weekly Wednesday workshop. This is an opportunity that was uh, that the Gulf States Regional Office, which I am working out of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, I'm Felicia Bell, the Sustainable Ag Specialist out of that office. And as all of us have gone through and is going through the pandemic, um, we are an office that do a lot of workshops. So the weekly Wednesday workshop was created so I can assist my farmers uh, doing 2020. And I've been allowed to continue this particular platform. So we invite people from all over the country and we invite of all experts, any industry, uh, regardless if you're a farmer or if you're extension agent or a federal employee, we invite all so you can share with with our clients around the country, your expertise. So that's what you are within today, a weekly Wednesday workshop. Today, we have a presenter, Allie Pinion, and I want to read about her. Um, her company is Dreaming the Beat and is a treatment-free apiary committed to providing a safe space for honeybees to live. And they work with many different hive styles, but then also, Allie is a bee guardian, and I love that. I love that title. In service to protecting pollinators and tending the homes of the bees in her apiary. She was drawn to working with the bees through her love of nature and decade working in the field of regenerative agriculture. So no further ado, I will turn it over to Allie at this time. And thank you so much for joining us, Allie. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here today. Um, I am going to share my screen and let's see here so I can pull up my slideshow. All right. So I live in Starkville, Mississippi. Um, and I will, like Felicia said, take questions at the end um, so I can kind of keep on track with uh, all the things that I have to go over today because there is a lot when talking about beginner beekeeping. Um, so I, this is my seventh year in beekeeping. I've been keeping bees um, for six years now. I started beekeeping actually as a way to learn more patience because I um, am not the most patient person and working with bees has really taught me a lot about that. Um, so I am a part-time beekeeper. Uh, I work the other part-time along with my husband who has a tree care service. So we actually work really well together because I'm re removing bees from tree calls that he gets, but I have around 30 hives. Um, I have a diversity in my income when it comes to beekeeping and I'll kind of talk more about that towards the end but um, I am a or have been a livestock farmer um, for many years over a decade and I you know wasn't didn't have a whole lot of income so I wanted to figure out how to have a relationship with bees and not have to invest a lot of money in um, the beehives, all the equipment that came with it. So I did a lot of research um, actually for years before I started beekeeping. And uh, I, you'll see, I'll recommend some books throughout this course. And I truly believe that it's important to, to learn a lot about beekeeping because many people say that you can be a beekeeper for decades and still not know very much anything about bees because there's so much to learn about them. And that's another reason I was really drawn to them because there's so much to learn. So um, most of my hives I've built myself uh, or my husband has helped me with those. And um, all but three of my hives I've caught feral bees. Uh, you don't hear me say wild bees because there's actually no such thing as wild bees here in the US. They're not a native, uh, honeybees are not native to the US. So we call them feral. And the uh, the honeybees that I have purchased have been um, some survivor stock, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Uh, so some quick little basic things that we need to think about before we even uh, purchase bees or catch bees 
is where do we have to locate the hives? Um, so they like to be facing south or southeast, and that is so that they can uh, be warmed, the hive can be warmed by the sun so they can leave earlier in the morning. And this is even more important in cooler climates, colder climates, and in the winter time in our southern climates. Here in Mississippi, we pretty much have, I'm in kind of uh, northeast central Mississippi, and our our bee season almost goes year round. Um, though I'm not checking my hives inside every month, I'm going to visit them from the outside and check on them monthly. Um, so you wanna make sure they're lifted off the ground because they can have issues with fire ants, mice, skunks really love to get their hands in a beehive. Um, and then also you wanna to talk to your neighbors because your neighbors um, might be allergic to bees. Um, there's really only a very, very small, I believe less than four or 5% of the population who's actually deathly allergic to bees, but many people think they're allergic to bees because they get localized swelling, which everyone gets swelling. If you could see my elbow right now, it's pretty big because I got a couple of stings yesterday. Um, so bee stings are actually good medicine, but talk to your neighbors. <laughs> Um, so hive placement, I like to put my hives around wood chips because bees actually need the um, mushroom, the mycelium, which is actually the roots of the mushroom and the mushroom is the fruit. They actually get a lot of their medicine from mushrooms. So having decaying wood. And also, if you think about it, where trees, excuse me, where bees are located in the wild, they are in trees and usually in tree hollows where that tree is starting to decay. Um, you want to make sure that your hives are level because if you are wanting to harvest your honey, you're going to have, you know, your frames and your comb simultaneously um, in there. And if you have comb that's going this way and comb that's going, you know, all sideways from the hive being off, off balance, then that's not going to do a favor for you. The bees don't really care, but when you're trying to work the hive, it's going to be difficult. So I like to have a level and a shovel, and I typically um, use concrete blocks to lift my hives off the ground. And I know this is kind of a different looking beehive, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you also want to think about what's in front of your beehives. Uh, your bees are going to need about 10 to 15 per, uh, feet in front of the hive to fly out. Um, a lot of times they're not even really um, looking where they're going. They're more sensing it. They're going towards the sun. And so if you're walking in front of it or you have some sort of pathway, um, they're just going to fly right into you. So you want to make sure you give them that good space for them to have to fly out of the hive. Now I have bees in my backyard. I have bees in uh, several of my customers' backyards. They have dogs. So, um, you know, as long as you don't have your beehives in a, in a main traffic way, having them in your own backyard is a really great place. Uh, so water, um, here in Mississippi, we have lots of water, but sometimes when we get in July and August, it gets really dry here. And so I just use chicken waterers and I put rocks in the chicken waterers and that way the bees can land on the rocks. Um, and some of you might have swimming pools and you might see dead bees floating in your swimming pools. It's because they're looking for that water and um, they don't have anywhere to land without drowning. So giving them some rocks. I also have a bird bath in my backyard that I, I keep sticks and rocks and petrified wood in so that the bees can land on that. And then you can also give them little packets of minerals. Um, I believe there's a couple of different types of like bee feed mixes that have um, different types of mushrooms, reishi mushroom, different things like that, herbs that you can mix and put in the water too. Um, and then spacing. So this is one of my uh, out yard apiaries. Uh, so typically it's best to do at least 10 feet apart and to kind of stagger them. You can see some of my hives are facing one way, some are facing the other. You can also see I have a variety of different types of hives out here. And uh, a lot of questions that I get are like, how many hives can a, a farm or a place support? Well, a good, um, a good rule of thumb is if you're not seeing native bees, then you have too many honeybees. So you want to make sure that you're seeing those native bees and native pollinators, and then you know you, you're not overdoing it. So on this farm, I have 
I think around 18 hives. And um, this is a um, organic uh, fruit and vegetable farm. So I know they have lots of uh, forage. I see many, many different types of bumblebees on this farm. So I know that I'm not overloaded when it comes to bees here. And then also when you're looking for places to have your hives, you know, it's good to have those um, like cottonwood trees, poplar trees, trees that are nice and resinous for bees to collect their medicines. And then we wanna make sure that we're providing pollen, uh, habitat for pollinators. So, um, places that if we're going, I, I feel like if we're going to be responsible honeybee keepers and honeybees are not native to the United States, then we need to provide habitat for those native pollinators. So some of that habitat might be buying little um, houses. This is one I made here for uh, native bees. You can just have patches of di um, bare dirt in your backyard. There's bees that like to bear, burrow under the ground. Um, you know, trees that are decaying, um, standing grasses, standing plant material, just a habitat for other pollinators is, is very important. So let's talk about the Langstroth hive. And this is the hive that most people are familiar with. Um, this is the box style hive you mostly see um, when you're on the, driving down the road and you see these uh, kind of file cabinet looking um, boxes. So. I really love the story behind the Langstroth hive. Um, uh, Lorenzo Langstroth actually started keeping bees because he realized that when he was working with, it made him feel less depressed. He fought depression throughout his life and he found that working with bees made him feel better, made, brought him closer to nature, brought him closer to the plants and the flowers and, you know, the, the wild world around him. And that's part of the reason why I started working with bees is to bring myself um, closer to the natural world. And um, so the way these hives were developed were to, to put um, movable frames. So before these uh, box style hives, most people were keeping bees in, uh, well, depending on where you were in, in more in Europe, they were more in uh, baskets. And it, the farther south you go into like the Mediterranean uh, area into um, Egypt and the Middle East, they are using more like clay pots and pipes that they were keeping bees in and then we go farther south into Africa and they were using uh, tree logs that they would actually lay horizontally and hang from from trees and so you'll see a hive that I use that's similar to that but um, so these Langstroths are supposed to be more like a uh, you know linear long like a tree like the inside of a hollow of a tree well um, I, I do like these hives I have several of them there are many pros and cons to these hives. And, and so I'll start with the, the pros. Um, so the pros would be they, you can produce a lot of honey in these hives. It's easy to find a mentor because most people utilize these types of hives. It's easy to find um, equipment. And if you're gonna get used equipment, I, you know, that's great. It's great to get used equipment, but you know, you also wanna make sure that you sanitize that. And I just use a handheld torch to sanitize. So it's easier to find equipment. Um, and you know, you can find equipment for extraction of honey, lots of different things like that. Um, the, the cons of this type of hive is each one of these boxes could weigh anywhere um, when it's loaded with honey from, 60 to 100 plus pounds and that's really heavy and especially if you see this um, kind of brownish orange yellow sticky substance on top of the frames and that close up there that is uh, propolis and it's bee glue it is the resins that bees are collecting from trees and it's really sticky so if you're trying to lift 100 pounds with this glue attached to another it it can get really uh, dangerous for your back and uh, you know some beekeepers have to quit keeping bees because of back injuries so that's one one con another one is um, that when you take the top off of this hive a box off of this hive it's exposing it's like taking the roof off of your house and I'll, I'll show you more about that later um, but so it just the bees get a little more upset when you open this hive um, 
And then there are some ways that you can actually um, reduce that weight by using um, eight frame boxes instead of 10 frame boxes. And you can use all mediums instead of deeps. Um, so that's some kind of terminology that you can learn a little bit later. I'm not gonna go really deep into that because I have a lot to cover today. But um, so one of the things, another con is that the hives are really thin. Um, so on the other type of hives that I build, I'm using two inch lumber. And here this is three quarter inch or less. So um, they are not very well insulated. And really in the summertime, it's more difficult. You think they need to be more insulated the winter and they do but in the summer they anytime they're building new comb and it gets super hot it can fall and it can crush bees um so in the winter i put another empty box on top of my hives and i kind of call it a quilt box that's kind of a warre hive thing but um I, I fill it full of wood chip, a pillowcase full of wood chips, and put that so that when the heat rises, it kind of stays within the hive. Um, so that's a way you can kind of combat that in the winter. And in the summer, you know, it, it's just a kind of a difficult thing to do. Um, putting them in part shade is a good thing, but I found that in Mississippi, my hives that are in partial shade have more issues with hive beetles. I don't use any chemical treatments on my hives. I, I believe in um, growing a more uh, healthy, vigorous bee population rather than um, treating mites and then growing a more healthy, vigorous mite that's resistant. Um, so I am trying to use natural ways of combating pests and disease. And I have found that um, part shade is about all the shade that, that that my bees can handle full shade they are just destroyed by by hive beetles um so i get asked about the flow hive all the time and in i have i don't own a flow hive um and the reason why is because i don't like plastics in the beehive um plastics don't allow for bees communication systems to work very well um, so they're, they're wax and the actual honeycomb shape, those little hexagons you see, that is actually part of their communication system. So they don't have hearing like we have. They sense things through vibration. And so um, you might even notice like in cathedrals and churches and um, different places that are really working with sound, they have that hexagonal um, honeycomb structure is because it um translate sound so well um so if we're putting wa if we're putting plastic in the hive it's messing with the bees communication also bees like to build little little holes and funnels to travel through and i think i have a slide on that later but in the flow hive they're not allowed to do that um the one good thing I see with the flow hive is that the honey extraction doesn't bother the bees as much but um, when you're extracting honey, you have to be careful about your moisture content. And um, so a lot of times um, you only want to harvest the capped honey that has like the white caps over it. And if you harvest the honey that's not capped, it increases your moisture content and can cause your honey to ferment. Well, if you're just turning a knob and letting all that honey drain out, you're mixing a lot of that green honey or moist honey in with your um your cured honey so um i personally don't suggest using a flow hive but you know it works well for a lot of people a lot of people swear by it but like i said i've never used it myself i don't like plastics in the beehive uh, so this is the top bar hive and we i was talking earlier about um in africa how they were uh, utilizing hollow logs that they would hang and suspend from trees so this is where the the top bar hive originated and um, it is also known as the kenyan top bar hive um, it was brought to the u.s some people say by the peace corps um les crowder really made it um let's see i have a book of his he really made it popular and um, he wrote Top Bar Beekeeping. And 
if you end up going to my website, I have a list of resources um, and all the books that I'm talking about and more and little synopsis of those books are on there. If you just go to uh, dreamingthebee.com and, and find the bees and then resources, you can find the books from there. Um, but that's a really great book if you're interested in top bar hives. Um, buzzaboutbees.net is a website by Philip Chandler and he has free plans there. The beehive at the very top, you can see that it's white and kind of turquoise with the little crystal sitting on the front. That is a hive that I built out of pallets. So um, this was my very first hive. I went around town. I picked up pallets. I had a piece of scrap tin. I um, made the whole thing out of pallets. The picture with me on the bottom in the hat, that's what it looked like um, afterwards. And you can see I've got it on sitting on top of two five gallon buckets. Um, so really this hive cost me little to nothing. Um, and then you'll see different people's opinions on where to put the holes on the top bar hives, whether on the um, ends or on the sides. And I've tried both. And I really think that putting them on the end with an extra hole or two on the side is the best way to go for the airflow um, for the bees. So this hive you can see is half of a hexagon. So it's got these 120 degree angles and it is a, a way that the bees, they found that at that 120 degree angle, it mimics that hexagon. So the bees won't attach to the sidewalls. Well, they do sometimes, but um, you just kind of have to work your way around that. I really think this is a great beginner hive because you can build it for next to nothing. There's free plans online. All you need is a, a butter knife and a veil. Uh, I'll talk more about, you know, the beekeeping equipment on a budget when we get towards the end. But this is one of my favorite hives. The second top bar hive I built, you can see on the far right that I built an observation window because I truly believe that the less you enter a beehive, the better, the stronger the bees are because the the air in the beehive is actually part of their immune system. The bees don't have an internal immune system like we humans do. They are more external. That's why they have that propolis because that is their immune system. So every time we open the hive, we are exposing them and, and releasing a lot of their immune system. And we're disturbing them. It, it, it pretty much every time we enter that hive, it takes them a week to or more to come back and fix the things that we've, the combs that we've separated, it, it stresses them out. So um, I really prefer these type of hives that you don't have to go in, but you know, four or five, six, seven, eight times a year tops. Um, and I have found that my hives that I visit less do way better and are way healthier and live way longer. Okay, so this is the inside of the top bar hive, and you can see um, me holding up the frame here. It's really important. I, I really strongly suggest starting with a top bar hive um, if you're brave enough, because it, um, and I say brave enough because um, they do attach combs sometimes, and you will read about how, you know, it's a little bit more of a learning curve, but I think you need that learning curve. And I'll tell you why. When we have a frame that is a square frame that the bees have drawn out comb in it, we just hold it all, turn it all which way. And um, in a top bar hive, you have to be so much more careful, work so much more slowly, and you can only turn your frame to one side or the other. You can't do it sideways because there's nothing holding it on and that comb will just fall over. So I believe that top bar hives really teach us to be more bee friendly. And I call my, the way I work with bees embodied beekeeping because it's more about bringing us into our bodies, listening to our senses. Um, when I open the hive, I encourage people to, to smell because the bees are actually releasing um, they're, they talk to each other through scent. So if you smell bananas in a beehive, that means they're mad. Um, so that's why I, I feel like embodied beekeeping is very important and to be in touch with your senses and top bar hives really encourage you to do that because you need to work slowly and methodically and think about what you're doing before you enter the hive. Um, 
top bar high, there's no heavy lifting. Each one of these frames might weigh four pounds if it's loaded with honey. Um, it does produce a little less honey and a little more wax because we're not giving them um, already drawn out comb or plastic foundation. And then I told you uh, about how bees like to make holes to travel through. It's kind of like their little highway or interstate system, I like to think. Um, you can see there on the right, the photo where the bees have made a little hole. And, you know, when we read about beekeeping and entering the hive, people tell us to get rid of burr comb, B-U-R-R. -R. I know my Southern accent can kind of uh, make things a little difficult to understand what I'm saying, but so burr comb is any comb that we humans don't think it needs to be where it is. It's not just in the frame, uh, but burr comb is actually what it's doing is channeling the airflow through the hive and it's bringing the air places that the bees want the air to flow through. And so sometimes these holes are for their little highway system and sometimes they are for airflow. So it's important to think about these things when we're, when we're working with the hive. So, um, so you can see here on the bottom, right, this is what we call a nuke or nucleus colony. It's, um, four or five frames, some people even sell three frames, but um, this is what most beekeepers, if you're having them in your area, they're, they'll sell you, and it comes with a queen, um, a couple of frames of brood, a couple of frames of honey and pollen, and um, so one of the things that the top bar hive makes difficult is if you are uh, wanting to buy a nucleus hive and you want to transfer those bees from that nucleus hive to your top bar hive, then you're going to have to cut the the comb. Or you can, um, there's other ways of doing it, and you can also make a, a different type of frame where you can just set the comb inside, but you are going to have to cut some of that out because the queen and the nurse bees are going to want to see stay with the brood and if any of you are beekeepers out there you can see that brood pattern looks awful and that's not a healthy colony there uh so let's see i think so uh pros i feel like i just said a lot of pros for the the top or hive some of the cons would be just a little bit of a learning curve because you have to move more slowly and more methodically. It's more difficult to go and purchase a nucleus colony um, if you're going to try to cut it out and put it in there. It's totally doable. I've done it before. Um, I really just prefer to put swarms in, uh, in these top bar hives. Um, and we'll talk about swarms too. Okay, so lay-ins hives. Um, this one's really my favorite. Uh, I started keeping Layens hives in 2019. Um, so there are free plans for the Layens hives at horizontalhives.com. And um, again, I have these on my website, but ooh, I don't know if you can see this. Keeping Bees with a Smile is a great book um, by Fedor, F-E-D-O-R, Lazutin, L-A-Z-U-T-I-N a great one for horizontal hives um, and let's see there's another one from by George Layens and it's called keeping bees in horizontal hives and this is also a really good one um, I just love these Layens hives you can check them four times a year and they're totally fine. Um, I love putting observation windows in these because it tells me my population of bees, um, if there's enough honey in there still, especially in the winter when I just want to take a peek in and see how much honey is left. Um, one of the things about these lay-ins hives is that you can actually reuse the comb in here. You can reuse the comb in the top bar hive also, but what I mean by reusing the comb after you've extracted it is you can put the lay-ins hive, you have to buy a particular um, lay-ins uh, honey frame extractor. So it won't work in the, the Langstroth extractors, but you can sling the honey out of these frames and put them back in the hive. Personally, I do crush comb honey, and I'll talk about that towards the end. Um, and then they, these, the plans for these, they come in 14, 
uh, frames. I did 19 so that I could do two colonies. Um, that way it's easier to overwinter two colonies in one box because they keep each other warmer. And, um, you know, I've had colonies fill out 19 frames, no problem. Like I just checked and I've got several hives full of honey. I don't harvest until um, the dandelions really come and bloom here in Mississippi because I want my bees to have their own honey throughout winter. So I, I'm a spring harvester, uh, honey harvester. But um, I just really, really love these hives. They um, are, the bees are so gentle when you work them because you're not taking the roof off. You still have frames. That is the one thing I had a difficult time um, building was the, the frames. Um, but, you know, you can always, I'm sure some of you have some great carpentry skills or you can ask someone to build them or you can order them off the horizontal hives website you can buy frames or boxes from there if you don't have the proper equipment to build the frames i would say build the box and then just order the frames from that website i'll go back so you can see it again horizontalhives.com lots of great information on there um, and i like to do uh, three holes across the bottom uh, you can see I've used wine corks to close the holes. Um, you can also use a, oh, it's like an entrance gate. I think I have it in a neck shown later, but it does a queen excluder, um, just airflow and then completely open. You can do those on there, but you know, those things are like two, three, four bucks a piece. So that adds up. Uh, and like I said, I, I try to do these things as economical as possible. I um, go to Lowe's and buy the low VOC paint that's on sale. That's why some of my hives are all the same colors a lot of times is because I'm just buying the paint that's on sale. I try to do this as, as budget friendly as possible. Um, and Let's see. Yeah, gentle bees, less disturbance. You can you can purchase foundation, wax foundation. There's no plastic foundation yet, I don't believe, but you can purchase wax foundation that you can put in these hives. Um, if you want to do, you need starter strips to kind of show the bees where to go. So if you want to purchase some wax foundation, you can just cut that wax foundation into strips and not have to use an entire strip for each frame. And that way, uh, it you know, a shorter, a smaller amount of strips will go farther for you. So if you have Langstroth hives, like the file cabinet looking hives, you can actually convert them to lay-ins. And you can see here on the right, the top right corner, that is two um, medium frames side by side that are going into kind of a converter frame that will go into the lay-ins box here. Now, if you look here, this hive um, with the little kid with the magnifying glass, I, I when I do hive tours for children, I'm always, I don't really ever take them into the Langstroth hives. I take them into the lay-ins hives, especially if they're feeling a little skittish because you can see there's no bees in the air. The bees are super calm here. And that's because I am only opening their colony two or three frames instead of taking the whole roof off and then in on the bottom right picture you'll see that i have a pillowcase there filled with wood chips and that is what i do for insulation in the winter time um i that you can get at your local co-op um and those those actually help to draw moisture out of the air because one of the most um, difficult things for bees in the winter time is that excess moisture. And so if you can have something that brings that excess moisture out or attracts it in some way to something else, and you know, like we said, naturally they'd be living in tree cavities, um, that can be really helpful for them because sometimes in winter bees will get these um, fungal diseases, they will get nausea, which is kind of like an upset stomach, um, they really benefit from having, um, you know, less moisture. 
Okay, so here we're, we talked a little bit about frame comparison. So on the top is that top, top left is the top bar hive. And then on the bottom, that is the Langstroth hive. And then on the, the right with me holding the frame, that is the Layens hive. And so you can see there are no bees on top of the frames in the top bar and on the Layens. But you see tons of bees on top of the frames in the Langstroth. And so this is why I really believe that top bar and layens hives are so much more uh, bee friendly and so much more beekeeper friendly and gentle because we're not we're opening a small space at a time we're not upsetting the bees we're not releasing all their air um, because like we said that air is is very beneficial it's part of their immune system and it's a lot less stressful on the beekeeper especially when you first get started with beekeeping um, and you open a hive and there are just bees everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And it, it can get a little nerve wracking. And, and bees, you know, are kind of like horses in a sense that they can sense fear in us. Um, and, you know, some people say that's because our body chemo uh, chemistry kind of changes a little bit and we sweat out that fear smell. But they they know when we are um, afraid and they sense that and kind of take advantage of it in a way. So if we can bring uh, a more gentle approach in the beginning, um, the better, I believe. And I also do a lot of hive tours for people who are wanting to start beekeeping. And I do a lot of hive tours for people who have Langstroth hives that are interested in top bar or land hives. And they're like, whoa, your beehives are so clean. and bees don't come out everywhere and what they mean by clean is um you can see on the langstroth hives there's propolis all over the top and on the the top bar and, and layens hives there's no propolis it's just wood across the top because the bees aren't able to travel up through there on the langstroths it's very important that the bees can travel up through that bee space you see it's about a quarter of an inch three eighths inches and what that is is Actually, Lorenzo Langstroth figured out that B space, but really we could say that ancient Egyptians figured that out. But anyway, um, Lorenzo Langstroth uh, developed this framing system with the B space because that is the space that is not too small that the bees want to fill it with propolis, and it's not too large that they'll fill it with comb. It's just that perfect um, Goldilocks medium that the bees will leave open and use it for, for traveling space but it's not needed in these horizontal hive systems. Okay, so uh, bee equipment. Oh, there's that bee gate on the far right that I was talking about. So with the green um, and then the, the silver bee gate. So that bee gate um, has an opening and you can purchase these on um, any beekeeper supply website. Amazon has them. The more of them that you buy, the cheaper they are. Um, I put these on all my swarm boxes my bait traps, uh, swarm traps, because when I'm traveling with them and bringing them to my bee yard, I like to keep them on that perforated hole one so that they can breathe. I don't ever use the clean, queen excluder, which is the horizontal line one, but you can see that um, my bees filled that up with propolis because there's two holes there and they decided that that entrance was way too big and way too much airflow. So they filled it with propolis. Okay, so let's talk about uh, foundation versus no foundation. So when I say foundation, I mean the, the top image is an empty frame that has no foundation, but you can see it has a small starter strip. And with the starter strip, you can use popsicle sticks, you can use paint sticks, you can, I've used wooden shims before, or like I've mentioned previously, you can buy some of the wax, um, foundation and cut it into small strips and the reason why we do that is because we want to give the guide to the bees for them to go straight because they will go all um, wacky uh, different ways and um, some people have found that they like to go along with the magnetic fields of the earth so sometimes if you just cannot get your bees to go to draw straight you need probably should move the hive somewhere else M maybe just 20 feet and it will help um so you never know but 
after the empty frame we have a the plastic foundation frame um i don't really i don't really like these some people swear by them because you can do small cells and that just means each individual hexagon is much smaller um, but I think this is just really adding up in the costs. I mean, there is an unlimited amount of things that you can buy when you're beekeeping. So um, that's why I go foundationless. Let the bees build their own comb. The, the bees comb needs to be recycled at least every three years anyway, because wax accumulates pesticides. Whether or not you are putting pesticides in your hives, it's still there's still pesticides in the air and water around us, so it still accumulates. And we want to keep our bees as healthy as possible. Okay, so after that, you see a frame that has plastic in the center that they've drawn wax on top of. So in that kind of left corner, you can see it's yellow, and then the wax is that yellow brown across the top. So the, the, the frame is actually wooden and then it has a plastic foundation. And then the last one, it is a wooden frame with a wax uh, foundation with wires in it. Um, like I said, I'm only using the foundationless. And then on the top bar on the bottom left, um, no foundation. And then that little heart shaped wax in the center, that is our lay-ins along with the top right that's the lay-ins hive with beautiful cat ready to harvest honey and those those frames are about 16 inches deep and um you'll see a bar across the center and what that bar is doing is after about 11 inches the bees will actually curve the comb back up so if you give them a little bit of a break so that they can attach their comb to that um, then they will, um, you know, draw more of a straight line. Um, bees are amazing engineers. Um, I have an undergraduate's degree in landscape architecture and urban planning, and we study ants on how they move and how they build their um, hives and their nests so that, um, you know, they are really efficient creatures. So they are doing good things for good reasons. All right. Oh, yeah. And then um, you can always use a wine cork. Um, I on my swarm traps that I don't have um, an entrance gate on. I just cut a piece of like a screen door screen and then duct tape around it. Um, if I'm moving hives or mo helping someone else move their hive, I just use a piece of screen with duct tape. You don't need to buy an entrance gate. OK, sourcing bees. So there are many different ways of sourcing bees. Uh, package bees are actually my least favorite way of sourcing bees, uh, unless you know the person that's making these package bees, uh, because sometimes what they're doing with the package bees is they are taking industrial bees that have been, um, you know, spent their lives on almond orchards or um, orange orchards and they are not sisters and they're just putting them in a box and then they're taking an artificially inseminated queen and they're putting in them in a box. And so nobody's related to anyone else really. And so it can just not be as cohesive and the um, survival rate can be quite low. But if you know someone that's making package bees and they are sis bee sisters and the queen is being raised um, as a relative, you know, then they're more likely are going to make it. Um, so nucleus hives, like we spoke of before, usually has a couple of frames of brood and honey and a queen. Um, usually if you're buying more local, you're going to get a nucleus hive. And a lot of times if you go buy a nucleus hive and you keep the box next year, you can bring the box back. They'll give you a discount and get your um, new set of bees. So um, the only bees that I have purchased have come from survivor stock. Um, there is a wonderful beekeeper here in Mississippi, uh, Red Belly Bees. He's already sold out for his April this year, but he um, has some really great survivor stock um, and he doesn't use any chemical treatments. So if you're looking for someone like that, um, reach out to your beekeeping groups, find people that are doing uh, bee breeding or um, that are, you know, trying to be 
uh, more natural beekeeping. And then the VSH or Varroa sensitive hygiene bees, those are some really great ones. They are, um, so we call hygienic bees, bees that are like grooming other bees, mites off of the other bees. Um, so survivor stock, sorry, I have, there's a lot of terminology that I don't always, um, yes, ask me my terminology, please. So survivor stock means that they have survived without any treatments for many years. And this man that I'm purchasing from, he says 30 plus years because he bought, he's been keeping them for 30 years and he bought them from someone who probably had them for decades as well. So survivor stock, my definition is um, some that have been, you know, feral bees that are localized to that area doing well with the climate that they're in and are not having any chemical treatments. Um, there's lots of debate on what treatment free actually means because some people could say that, you know, um, anything could be a treatment from feeding the be feeding your bees to uh, doing splits could be considered a treatment because that m reduces the chances that they'll have Varroa. Um, so, so, yes, survivor stock is going to be bees that are from your area and have lived in your area for a long time. So they're used to your climate. They're used to the pests that are already there and that they are um, not being uh, haven't been chemically treated. Um, and then the Varroa sensitive hygiene are the hygienic bees that are going to be grooming um, other bees. I mean, sorry, grooming their sister bees, grooming mites off of them. And that's another reason I really like those observation windows is because a lot of times those Varroa mites will hide under the abdomen plates in the bee. And when they're climbing on that window, you can see their bellies and see Varroa mites. Um, and once you start seeing Varroa mites, that's not a good sign. Um, <laughs> but anyway, some bees can handle a few Varroa and some just can't handle them at all. All right, so my favorite favorite, favorite part of working with bees is swarms. And I could teach classes on uh, swarms alone. Let me make sure I answered that whole question. Yeah, okay, I did. All right, so what is a swarm? A swarm is actually the birth of a new colony. So baby bees might be born um, all but three months out of the year, but a swarm is only born a couple, once to two times a year, maybe more. But this is actually the birth of a, of a new colony. So bees are a super organism, which means one bee cannot live alone. The bees need to have their sister bees and they need to have the queen and they also need to have the drones, the male bees. So uh, when we when we see a swarm, it's going to have the old queen a lot of times, not always, but the old queen and about a third of the bees and they'll take some of the honey too and um they will leave the hive and in this like beautiful bee tornado vortex the most incredible magical spiritual thing you'll ever experience um and then they so they basically are one organism they disassociate and then they come back together as one organism and land on a, a tree and usually a tree because they like to be about 10 to 15 feet in the air um, and they will land there and then they go and they do a democratic voting system where they go and they look at a place they come back they do a dance to show their sisters to go check out that place and then they'll come back and however many bees are voting for one place they'll move to that place so a swarm might land and stay for an hour or it might stay for three days and then it might get up and move again. Um, so swarms usually happen around full moons. They usually happen um, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., usually the day after a rain. Um, bees are really in tune with the weather. So um, sometimes they will get caught in the rain and then they'll just build a, a colony right there in the tree. They'll start building comb. I've had that situation happen a lot. Um, and like I said, there are no wild honeybees. There are only feral honeybees here in the United States. When you catch a swarm, um, if it is larger than a football, it's more likely to survive. If it is smaller than a football, it's less likely to survive. And you want to 
possibly combine it with other colonies. Some people don't even like to bring swarms to their farms or their apiaries because sometimes they can have loads of Varroa. So let's see, okay. So um, there's a difference between swarming and absconding. And when we see bees, so they say a swarm in May is worth a silver spoon, a swarm, no. I forget, but there's a really cute saying that swarm in May's are really great. Swarm in June's are really great. Swarm in July is not worth anything because a lot of times they are absconding, which is more like a death swarm. They are either sick, have a varroa mite load, um, and they're swarming to die. And they are, what they're actually doing is trying to save their sisters and swarm and move away somewhere else to die. And, um, Oh, somebody told me. All right, here we go. Swarm in May is worth a load of hay. Swarm in June is worth a silver spoon. A swarm in July ain't worth a fly. Yes, that's it. Love it. And so um, I start seeing swarms here around in Mississippi, March 14th, which is my husband's birthday. And we've caught a swarm the last three years on that day. Um, and all the way up until the first week of June start getting really good swarms. Um, most of the time it's healthy bees that are swarming because in order for the queen, the old queen to want to leave, she's going to have to have plenty of honey left for those behind her, plenty of eggs left for those behind her and um, plenty of pollen. So usually they're healthy, but you kind of also just want to take a look at them and see how they're acting, see how their wings are looking. Um, and you know you can tell a lot by that but most of the time the swarms are pretty healthy so uh what to have in your swarm kit so i've seen a lot of people actually just use a, a cardboard box to catch swarms in you can see i have a one of my lands nucleus hives there i'm catching a swarm in um it's good to have some pruning shears um <clears throat> excuse me Many years I have um, used, just cut and drop them into a box and they don't like that. I've learned that it's best if you get them to move into the box, let them choose. So what I do now is I set a ladder. Let's see if I have a picture. I'll set a ladder underneath the colony and then I will try to get a piece of wood or some grass or a branch or something and get them to walk they don't like to walk down so if you can get them walk up the better but get them to walk into the box because they're more likely to to stay that way swarms you're not always going to get them to stay it's just sometimes they get it in their head and they they're going to leave so in if you're serious about swarm catching put in your vehicle a painter's cloth or some kind of sheet or something. Um, keep your bee suit or veil or whatever um, and a hive tool and um, a feather or something to kind of scrape bees in with and um, some sort of box or something to transfer them with. And because I call myself a bee midwife and I'm on call in the spring because there's a lot of bees that um are swarming so bait hives um they like to be about 40 liters in size um sometimes i put old comb in them a lot of times i'm just using old boxes bees have already lived in you can use a uh, one deep, langstroth deep you can paint them with wax on the inside um but you like brood wax smelly wax that's been in the beehive um and this is actually my sweet, sweet, sweet husband on his birthday evening carrying a tree, uh, bees down from a tree for me. <laughs> um, so lemongrass essential oil is actually the scent that a healthy, happy hive puts off. So if you get a little pill bottle, one of those little uh, pill bottles and a um, cotton swab or not swab, cotton ball and a few drops three, four max, don't put a lot of drops in there, poke some holes in it. It can kind of be like a slow release smell. Um, and then there are some places 
mostly in Europe, but there are some places where it's illegal to catch swarms. I know in a lot of cities, maybe even in the northeast, you have no northwest, you have to be on a swarm list to to catch bees. Um, and then if your neighbor has beehives and you catch a swarm, you need to talk with them and make sure it wasn't their bees. And they can go check by looking and seeing if there's queen cells because they're probably gonna, going to want their swarm. Um, so that's just a courteous thing to do. All right, so um, let's see. How painful, oh, such a great, great question. Thank you for that. Um, so swarming bees are filled with honey. They gorge themselves on honey so that they can have three or four days to make it without collecting more nectar. And so they are, and they have no, um, no home to defend. So they are really, really gentle. Probably the most gentle you'll ever be with bees will be in that swarming state. Now, caveat is bees do not like perfumes. They don't like artificial scents and they surely don't like you swatting at them. They don't like fast movement. They are moving at a high frequency. So if you are moving slowly, they will not even really mess with you at all. So the best time to work with bees and get to know them and get comfortable with them is working with a swarm. Anytime I see a swarm in action making that like bee tornado, I slowly walk through that swarm with my hands out because I'm telling you, it is the most spiritual experience. I I'll cry almost every time. And um, you will find all sorts of information about bees throughout many different cultures and uh, many different religions and how spiritual the connection that bees are. I, Jesus was even known as honey in the rock. There's a book called The Sacred Bee that talks about all this. That, but yes, working with bees in this swarming state, they are very gentle, least likely to sting you. Um, so if you can leave the swarm box at the place that you caught the swarm overnight to make sure you get all the bees, because there will be some scouts and foragers that are mostly scouts, really, because they don't have anywhere to put the forage, um, that are still out flying. And so if you leave that box there overnight, it will give them a chance to come back. And then after dark, you come and well, you don't have to leave it overnight. I should not have said that. Leave the box until dark. Come back after dark, close the box, and then bring them. There's no need to leave it overnight. I'm, I'd messed up on that. Okay, um, moving bees into the hive. Like I said, bees want to crawl up, but a lot of times that's a difficult thing to do. These, this swarm on this brick wall that I still have this swarm, this is a four year old colony. Um, they, that was one of the hardest swarms I've had to get into a box because they did not want to be in that box. And I used a piece of cardboard two pieces of cardboard and just kind of scooped them. And then I let them walk off the cardboard into the box. That's important to let them think they are choosing that space. So if I use a dust pan, that was another really uh, great thing to keep in your bee kit is a dust pan. And you just can kind of scoop them with the, the dust pan very slowly. I mean, if you think you're moving slow, go 10 notches slower, just barely. That's why I said bees teach you patience because moving very slowly is a must. I don't use gloves anymore and I only use a veil. And when you work that way, it really encourages you to move slowly. Um, so I know you're going to be excited to have a swarm and you're really going to want to check it out and see what's going on in there. But just wait. Let your swarm stay in the box. Don't open it for two or three weeks at least. And I also know I said that bees don't like it when you're getting in the hive and a lot. And a lot of the bee books that you'll read, they'll say, oh, go and check your hive every week, every two weeks, every three weeks. I think it's important as a beginning beekeeper to check your hives often so that you learn what to look for. I think it's important. And I also think that the bees forgive you. I think that they give you a grace period. Now you might not, a lot of beginning beekeepers lose their colonies and a lot of times that's because they're entering the hive so much, but it's part of the learning process. And especially if you get a swarm, 
a lot of times they don't always make it. Um, so, and they decide to leave. So, you know, don't let that, you know, bother you. It's just part of the beekeeping process. Um, especially if you're trying to go no chemical treatments. Okay, so this is a Russian Skyon. And what this is, is if you are trying to get some bees that are in your bee yard. Um, so it's just three poles with a little piece of tin on top and then some burlap with lemongrass essential oil. And this is not at my farm. This is at one of the farms I studied on several years ago. Um, but what this does is it attracts the bees to this spot. So a lot of times in our apiaries during this time of year, we're going to see our own bees swarming. And bee swarming is actually a good thing. It has a break in the brood cycle, the bees. And the baby bees are where the varroa mites live and feed on and birth baby their babies. So having a, a couple of week break is a good thing. And it's a way a lot of uh, treatment free or chemical free beekeepers um, kind of treat their hives. But um, so you're going to have constant swarming if you're like me. And uh, that just helps me build my hive. Uh, some of them I will try to do some swarming preventive measures, but some of them I just let them swarm. And then I catch them and then I grow my apiary or I pass them on to one of my mentees. Um, so this is just a, a great way. You can even just tie a piece of burlap with essential lemongrass essential oil two, three, four drops, not more than that, in a tree. Um, you can even bait one of you, if you've purchased or built a beehive, you can get some old comb, old brood comb from a friend beekeeper and paint that, melt it down, paint it in the hive, um, and use that to just kind of attract bees to, to your, your box. Okay, so I told y'all I was going to talk about honey extraction. I don't have fancy equipment. The most fancy thing that I have is a fruit press. Um, and I didn't get that until about two years ago. Um, so you can use a colander with some cheesecloth and a potato smasher and be perfectly fine. And as a person who works with bees and the medicine that and the products of the hive as medicine, I really prefer press and strain honey and those and people who are looking for that specialty market of honey and um, they're going to want they're going to want the press and strain. And I'll tell you why. When you press and strain the honey, you're getting a lot more pollen and, and propolis, which is that bee medicine. And the pollen is what helps people with allergens. Um, it, pollen also contains a lot of the medicinal traits of the plant as well as the nectars, which become honey. Um, and also it preserves more of the floral bouquet of the, of the honey. And so, yes, there are um, honey sommeliers. So I prefer press and strain honey. It's more medicinal. You can advertise it as more medicinal. You don't have to buy all the equipment. And I don't know if any of y'all have used honey extraction equipment, but that stuff is not an easy thing to clean up. Um, I mean, you can go set it outside and let your bees clean it, but if you get a good wind blow and, you know, then you get leaves and dirt and all that, and you still got to do a deep scrub on it. So I have a honey press and I use that when I, um, do larger, uh, honey extraction. And then I have, when I want to do like, um, a particular, harvest of you know clover honey or um, goldenrod honey or a particular type of honey then um, I'll just use the crush and strain and you can kind of see the different honey in your beehives you'll learn to read which honey is which by what honey they're putting up and what's flowering at the different times and there are people who really look for you know specialty honeys um if someone wants you know, dandelion honey that's, or, um, you know, I have my bees on a strawberry farm. So if they're wanting that more lighter clover dandelion, uh, you know, l light colored, light flavored honey, then you can harvest that at um, the early spring. And you can, you know, sell those specialty honeys for more rather than just wildflower honey. Um, and then you'll see the cut comb honey 
which you can also get more for. And I just use a biscuit cutter. Like they, <laughs> there's all these little fancy things that you can purchase to do your like Ross rounds and different things like that. But biscuit cutter and a mason jar, perfect. Um, so protective gear. I have lots of different bee suits because I work with, uh, I do hive tours um, for adults and children and families. Um, so I have lots of different types of bee suits, uh, bee veils. Uh, you can see my mom and I in the bottom right corner, uh, this um, Bella Beak, B-E-L-L-A-B-E-E-K dot com has these beautiful veils for uh, men and women but they're really nice i really like those um then you can see on the top right i'm just using a regular bug net on top of a straw hat on um top left that was more my beginning beekeeper phase and i had gloves on and you know a full suit i, I really are not a full suit it's just a jacket I never have had a full suit. Um, my grandfather actually bought me a um, Ultra Breeze, which on my website under the resources, I also have all these, this my jackets that I prefer, gloves that I prefer, leather. Um, so really all you need is a long sleeve shirt. Um, and I like to get like painter's clothes because they're white and um, bees aren't as disturbed by white as they are darker colors and it's hot here in Mississippi and so lighter colors are better painters pants uh, or a painters jumpsuit or painters um, button-up shirt and then you can get a bug net with a straw hat and you know some leather gardening gloves and you're you're good to go you don't need to buy all the the fancy stuff okay um, so this is my everyday out to the bee yard um, I have a knife if I need to cut comb, I have my little rain gear notebook because you will get sweat, you will get honey, you will get propolis um, all over your notebook. So I really do recommend one of those, you know, right in the rain books. And then my smoker and my veil. And then I just have like some scissors, some wooden shims, um, some wine corks. And then my little painter's, um, I don't know what you'd call that, bag. Thing, belt um, to carry all that stuff in with a little magnet. You can see the magnet is that little square dark spot to um, magnet my um, hive tools, which you don't need a hive tool. You can use a butter knife. So you can see uh, the butter knife that I have and the larger knife and the feather. Like, really, you don't have to buy anything. Um, for smoker fuel, all these different smoker fuels you can purchase. I take some cedar, I wrap it, I let it dry. I put it in my smoker. You know what the best smoker fuel is? Horse manure or cow manure. With all that hay still in it and it dries out and it smokes and it lasts a really, really long time. Okay, um, products of the hive. So a way of diversifying and not just depending on honey for your beekeeping. Hive tours. People really love them. Kids love them, doing them for birthdays. Um, I did a lot of family tours during COVID because I didn't want to really mix people together. So family tours were a nice thing. Um, we do uh, bee meditations. I take people and do meditations out in the bee yard, and there's a lot of history around bees and meditating, um, bee yoga, uh, hosting hives. So I host hives in um, other people's yards. So um, they pay me a monthly fee and I take care of the bees. They get a certain percentage off any honey harvested um, and then they get uh, so many free hive tours with that or I guess it's included in the price. Um, propolis, which is that bee medicine. Uh, I sell a lot of propolis tincture. It's just high proof alcohol. Um, salves that you can make with the propolis um, and honey shampoos um, really great for skin care I mean just honey itself on the scalp or on the face on the body uh, wound care um, particularly burns sell quite a bit of beeswax wraps and bags um, getting into leather work so I am making some uh, leather and cutting board uh, salves and even like puppy feet salves. Um, I do a lot of candle sales. Um, hand dipped candles are my specialty. Um, 
And then we talked about uh, honey harvesting for special types of flowers and what's in season. I do herbal infused honey and you have to be careful about that because a lot of places we require them to be done in an expected kitchen. But a lot of times if you know someone who has a restaurant, they are closed down for a certain day, you can rent um, a kitchen and, and make those. Um, yeah, so I was going to open up for questions now, but I just wanted to mention I have a lot of uh, resources on my website for free. I have a YouTube channel that I've done several different talks and things on that you can check out. I also do online uh, mentorships. Oh yeah, and Hive sponsorships. So that's another source of revenue that I do where um, people sponsor some of my beehives and then I give them updates. There's different tiers of rewards, but I give them updates on the bees. They might receive candles, they might receive honey. Um, yeah, so Hive sponsorships and then yeah, lots of resources on my website. And now uh, we can open up for questions. Thank you so much, Allie. All right, everyone, let me open it up where you can ask questions on your own. And Allie, again, I'll ask you to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> great, great, great. Thanks, everyone. Do you have any questions? Any and questions? I also want to say, while y'all are thinking about questions, um, there's a lot of fear around bee stings. But I will tell you that bee stings are some of the best medicine that we have. It has been found to kill cancer to um, fight. Uh, it actually is found to kill COVID. I mean, it. there are so many different things that bee stings are beneficial to. So I have trained myself to think when I do get a bee sting, oh, that's medicine. And thank you, bee. I'm sorry you had to lose your life. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. How long have I been using the lay -in hive? So this will be my fourth year of using the lay -in hive. And um, I'm, I'm finding that the mortality rate is much lower on um, the lay-ins hive, probably because I'm having to open the hive a lot less. Um, so I'm really, really loving those hives. Actually, the new ones that I have in building are lay-ins hives. I, I also really love my top bar hives, um, but I like having the frames. Um, so... One of the things I forgot to mention is um, in the Lang when you have a Langstroth, you have so much equipment that you have to store. So like you see a lot of people that just have sh sheds full of bee stuff. With the Lay-Ins Hive, you just store a few frames. And with the top bar, you don't have to store anything. Like all you have are these little top bars. And, um, you know, I store my top bars in a five-gallon bucket. So like n no storage space. Okay. Um, for a beginner, what is the biggest mistake you made to avoid and what is the biggest challenge? Ooh, okay. I'm going to try to say this without crying. <laughs> biggest mistake I made when I was um, second year beekeeping, I caught the biggest swarm I'd ever caught. This swarm had to be five pounds. I'd been watching this, col this colony, this wild colony for over a year super excited about getting the swarm so i caught the swarm i brought it home and you remember that b gate that that i said oh i don't ever use that queen excluder i used that queen excluder on that swarm because i was like i don't want this swarm to leave i use that queen excluder those bees overheated in that hive and i killed the hive and that is the only hive that that has happened to me with and it broke my heart I, I, it was and I was like okay now I know I need to be thinking in favor of the bee and not in favor of myself and my wants because when I start thinking me first the bees don't make it okay what was the second part of that question and what is the biggest challenge to overcome biggest challenge to overcome is being okay with losing hives and it took me probably about four years to be okay with that 
And um, being a person who does not do chemical treatments, we do lose a lot of hives in the beginning because we're building that survivor stock. And I finally learned, I read this book called The Song of Increase by Jacqueline Freeman. And she talks about how the, the bees that are dying or the bees that are absconding and leaving, they are doing that for the greater purpose of growing a better and healthier and stronger bee. And that, you know, I, those bees, I learned from them and I'm grateful for them, but it was not their time to continue with me. And either they wanted to go live elsewhere or they needed to die. And to save the other bees because they might have had disease or mites. So I think that is the biggest challenge is just losing bees. Uh, and this year, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. What, what, what? This year I had zero losses. First year to have zero. Last year I had about 20%. The year before it was 15 and it was higher in the previous years, but zero this year. So yes, Felicia. No, I was going to help you out. We skipped some questions, so I wanted to oh, go back okay. to those. As a beginner, how many hives should you start out with? Oh, great question. I meant to put that on my slide. I suggest at least two to three. Some people say two to five, but um, you're more likely to lose at least one or two hives. So try to start with three if you can. But sometimes when you're doing the beekeeping on a budget, you know, you might only start with one and that's fine. Learn from that one, but also learn to be okay with them possibly leaving. Gotcha. Thank you. The next one. So I am very interested in starting to have this year and also building my own. Do people sell survivor stock bees that aren't in newts? Um, so that is going to be a good question for your local beekeepers association. Um, or trying to uh, usually swarms or survivor stock unless you are um, near someone else's bee yard and getting someone else's swarms um, a lot of times the, the swarms are survivor stock um, so I, I personally like nukes because I know that that's one family of bees but yeah so try to try to catch some swarms great do you try to keep the honey bees away from native bees um, well, that's kind of a difficult thing because the honeybees are traveling like three miles and then the native bees are also um, traveling as well. So what I try to do is make sure that I have habitat for both. Okay, because the next question asks, do you do anything to address resource competition? Yes, plant, plant flowers, plant native plants. And actually people are... Um, you know, you always think flowers, 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 but trees are better for the bees because trees are providing the resins that they need. And also, you know, trees are transpiring, transpiring moisture. So, you know, you're thinking about the shade they're providing, the more moisture in the air, they're making more microclimates and the flowers that these trees, like um, depending on your area, you know, um, tulip poplars here in the south are really great bee trees. So just look for your native bee trees. And if you can't plant trees, then the flowers, that's what's the reason we have issues with bees in the U.S. is because we don't have habitat, you know. Great. Can you show the last resource slide again? Sure. Yeah, because you, you took it out really, really fast. So people oh, copying it. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. So yes, while you're that doing back. that, how much space do you give each hive? So I like to give them at least 10 feet um, around because there's this thing that we call drift in the beekeeping world that bees will go to the hive that is near them or kind of around them because they are doing like spatial orientation like I said, they don't see like we see and they don't hear like we hear. They are working with the Earth's magnetic fields to kind of figure out where their hive is. And so um, it's good to like paint things on the front of your hive so that they can kind of see those things. But a lot of times they're still going to drift. And if you give them at least 10 feet, you're going to reduce that drift by a dra drastic amount. Okay. And this may be the same answer, but of course I want to ask it, how far away from a walk space should the hive openings uh, should be? 
Um, 10 to 15 feet. You want to give them 10 to 15 feet to be able to, uh, you know, because they're going to, they're going fast and they're going to fly straight out and straight up out of their hive. So you need to give them 10 to 15 feet of, of space to fly. Great. Next question. What do you do to keep the hive safe from predators? Um, do you use an electric fence? Yes. I, luckily, I am not in bear country. Um, so as far as um, the what all that I really have to do is keep them about a foot or two off the ground. Um, but in places in South Mississippi, they are seeing bear activity. Um, so electric fences are important. Um, and especially if you are working with cattle and bees, cows are going to want to scratch on the beehives and push them over. Goats will do the same thing and climb on top of them. So you, yes, you're going to want to put some sort of fencing around them to keep livestock out and um, electric fencing does work well. Great, thank you. I'm in South Central Texas. Which type of hive do you recommend for really warm areas? And then the second part of that question, what is some advice for handling bees in hot weather? Okay, so you are in luck being in Texas because they actually have some agricultural, um, oh, I forget exactly what they're called, but they will pay you, They the, the government will pay you to put your, bees on farmers lands or give them subsidies so you might want to check into that I don't know enough about it but beekeepers in Texas are very lucky for that um, so warm area um, so top bar hives are really great for warm areas Lay-ins hives are really great um, Langstroth hives if you can get them to be a little bit more insulated um, some people will actually just put another big box on top of their um, hives um, Really any any style you could do in warm areas because bees just really do better. Um, but then you also have to think about working them year round. Um, but I, I just, I'm really more in favor of the lay-ins hive because it's just so easy to work with and it's so well insulated. Um, so I, I just prefer the lay-ins for the warm climates. Great, thank you. So this is from someone in, oh, I lost it. Let me grab it again. I believe here, um, I live in Pontotoc, so I'm assuming here in Mississippi. So you may have a particular person that I could get them from. I'm assuming bees to get bees from. I I mean, Bob Russell at Red Belly Bees, he's my go-to. He even mentors me from time to time when I have questions. He's a great guy. Um, he's sold out for April, but he's taking orders for May. So uh, beeempire.com is his website, but he's a, he's a great guy. Great. And next, can you get laying hives locally? Um, so you can order them online. I'm not really sure what locally is to you, um, mm -hmm. but some people are building them. Some people are selling them on Etsy. Uh, when I decided that I wanted to increase my uh, amount, I actually went to a local carpenter and gave him the plans and asked him to build them for me. And then he ended up liking it so much he built his own. Um, so as far as like going to a co-op, no, you're not going to find probably a top bar or you're just going to find the Langstroth there. Second part of that is they're planning to grow moringa trees. Is this a good one for bees? Oh, I don't know enough about moringa trees to answer that question. I'm so sorry. Um, I can help with that, Allie. They, do, they don't have blooms. Don't our bees have to have some type of bloom or so forth? They do. I, they need I the know. blooms for the collect the pollen. Yes. I know the, the moringa tree have leaves but no bloom, and that may be an older tree, you may move in, but when you're first growing a moringa, it's strictly leaves, there's no blooms on it. But I can't speak to, you know, if the tree get 15, 20 years old, I, I haven't had one that long, uh, but it's plenty, plenty of research online uh, about the moringa tree. Uh, so you may be able to read up on it and research to see if that particular 
tree bloom? And if so, what year or what age of tree? Um, and then Angela that asked the question about you uh, live in Texas, Allie, she was saying she worked for a food bank with a farm and that's what they're really trying to trying to do. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And there are a lot of people who have survived 80% of their diet just on bees, being the bee, the honey, the brood, the pollen. Um, so I, I really think that's kind of cool. You're doing the food bank with that too. So love that. Great. Next question. Can free range land hens and beehives coexist in the same area? Oh, yes. And <laughs> chickens are so, so, so great to have around beehives because they're eating a lot of those pests. Um, a lot of the hive beetles that are coming up from the ground into the beehive, those chickens are eating it. The chickens are eating the dead bees or the bees that might have viruses that are on the ground trying to get back to the hive. Um, I have a little dog. Well, she's 30 pounds, but she eats bees. <laughs> so she's kind of like my free range chicken. But yes, that they're, they're really great to, to have together. Um, usually they don't eat the, the bees flying in and out of the colony. So yeah, they're, they're great to coexist. Great. And thank you all, Miss Angela, Miss um, Miss Angela McDermott and Miss Angela Keys uh, for the Moringa. I have utilized Moringa for many years medicinally and just in the last few years start actually growing them. So thank you uh, because no, I didn't have that 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 uh, knowledge of that they bloom. So alley Moringa trees do bloom. So they were able to answer that for us. Thank you so much. So is it any other questions? We got a few minutes. We'll close out at, at 3.30 Central Time. Is there any other questions you would like to add? You could drop them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. And we thank you so much for joining us today and, and staying with us this, this length of time. Our weekly Wednesday workshops is open um, to as long as our speakers need it. I don't ever like capping them off. I just open it up. So some of my speakers have an hour, hour and a half, which many of you all have co been coming to my weekly Wednesday workshop. So you know it varies, uh, but I just open it up and let my speaker go at it because one, I, this is pertinent information we need. And then it's, we're offering it to farmers around the country. And so sometimes you could be sitting at home and you can listen to an hour and a half, two hour workshop and it doesn't bother you. But I understand people had to get off of work and other uh, meetings and so forth, but we appreciate everyone joining us. Another question come through, are there any trees that you recommend to provide for the bees? Yeah, so um, it depends on where you are in the country. In the south, uh, we really like, uh, so native trees is what I'm going to say first, because there are um, a lot of beekeepers that depend on privet and Chinese tallow here, and they are really not great trees. So they're not native, and they are very invasive. So um, I really like uh, tulip poplars. Cottonwood trees are really great for um, their the buds. They produce this um, sticky resin um, that you can also collect yourself and make uh, healing balms with. Um, so yeah, there are many, many different types of really important trees like red maples are some of the very first early blooming. Um, that's how we know the honey flow is going to start here in uh, Starkville in northern Mississippi is that red maple. We know the honey flow is about to come on. So when you're thinking about different trees to plant or different flowers for the bees, think about those early bloomers and then those late bloomers. Um, if you're thinking about flowers, sunflower is so great because it's blooming such a long time and sometimes they'll continuously um, die off and bloom. So uh, really think about what, um, what time of year. Um, the crocus is also, uh, I know it's more expensive flower, but some of the first flowers, um, so yeah, thinking of early and late season. Wow. Yes, the crocus is very expensive, but such a beautiful <laughs> flower. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and then Mr. Gregory, this is a question about the flow high. Uh, Allie did speak on that. So wanted to let everyone know, again, this will be on our NCAT um, ATRA YouTube channel. So this video will be housed there, but she did go in extensive talk about the flow hive, the pros and cons of the flow hive, uh, of her opinion about that. So if you could just give us a little bit to get that particular video uploaded. And we thank everyone. We appreciate all of the positive feedback we're getting in the chat about today's session. And we thank you so much. And Allie, do you mind just closing us out today? No, well, thank you everyone so much for um, being here. And um, I, can I close us out with a hum? Felicia? Yes, you may, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one of the things I really like to do when I'm doing group uh, talking about bees is I get everyone to hum together. And you can hum if you want or you don't have to, but you know, it just kind of gets you settled in your body. And anytime I work a beehive, I hum first because it brings me to the present moment. And it's kind of like an offering to the bees. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining me. Um, I've got my email up if you have any further questions. And yeah, we'll just take a deep breath in. Mm -hmm. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Everyone have a Thanks, great Allie. day. Thank you. Thanks, Felicia. Great. Thank Fantastic. You. You're welcome. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you.